Hi class, Dr. Jim here. In this lecture today, we're actually going to be looking at some of the techniques that are involved in molecular biology. And these have really revolutionized how biology is looked at today. And so in the last 30 to 40 years, we've really come a long way in how we've actually been able to change and manipulate DNA. And that's what we're really looking at. That's kind of the core, the heart of what we're looking at today is how we can actually change and manipulate the DNA to give us the products that we need, whether it's medicine, uh, foods, or other things like that. And so that's what we're going to kind of look at, some of these different techniques that are involved in molecular biology. Now, some of you might actually find that these are kind of interesting and you want to look into this further. MATC does a very good job of offering some classes in biotechnology. And if you're really interested in some of these techniques and you might say, hey, you know, I want to learn more about them. I recommend taking some of these classes. But again, if you have any questions or you're kind of interested in this stuff and you want to know more, please come talk to me because I've done a lot of these techniques myself in the lab and showing you how, how some of these things work. So let's find out a little bit more about molecular biology today, okay? So one of the big things with DNA is some of the certain properties that it has. And now I've told you before, DNA is a double-stranded helix. That's how it's found in na nature. It has the phosphate sugar backbone, and then it has the bases and the nitrogen bases that are the rungs of the ladder. Okay? The other thing is, is that the base pairs are connected with hydrogen bonds. And this is really important because it allows us to open and close the DNA very easily. And the reason why that they're hydrogen bonds and not some other like covalent bonds is because you want to be able to open and close the DNA very quickly so that you can either make copies of DNA or make new strands of DNA when we're talking about replication. But one of the interesting intrinsic properties of DNA is that if you heat it up, you actually can separate the strands out. So if you heat the DNA up to 95 degrees, unlike proteins which degrade and fall apart, DNA actually stays structurally together. The issue is, is that the strands themselves come apart. And so what you'll see is that the two strands actually separate. And you can see down here, if you heat up the DNA to 95 degrees, the strands, the base pairs, the hydrogen bonds actually open up. And if you cool the DNA, and we can cool the DNA back down, the DNA can actually come back together. It finds its complementary bases and then comes back together. And in this next slide, I'll actually show you a little graphic of how this works. So here's my fragment of DNA. I heat it up to 95 degrees and I can separate the DNA out. Now if I take that DNA out of the 95 degree water and put it into a refrigerator, my DNA will find its complementary base, bases and come back together and form the double-stranded DNA again. And so this is a really important technique because we utilize this in quite a few of the techniques that I'm going to show you today. We're going to see this when we copy DNA and also when we read the DNA. We have to open up the DNA in order to be able to change it and manipulate it. Okay? Very important uh, property of DNA is being able to open and close it. So now what we're going to look at is the molecular biology toolbox. This is something that any molecular biologist or anyone that's going into molecular biology really should know. And there's really five things that we can do and manipulate DNA. The first one is that we can actually cut DNA. And so we have these things called molecular scissors known as restriction enzymes that go in and chop the DNA up. Okay. Another thing we can do is then take those fragments that we make and glue them back together. And this is really important when we want to take DNA from different organisms and put them back together like Frankenstein. Okay. We can also measure these sizes of fragments we make by using a technique called gel electrophoresis. And this acts kind of like a ruler that we want to measure the DNA. We also can make lots and lots of copies of DNA. And why is this important? Well, think about the crime scene where you might have one splatter of blood from the, from the suspect or some skin cells that are left behind. You can actually take those cells, take the DNA from that cell and make millions of copies of that DNA in order to actually look at the DNA and figure out if that person really is guilty or not and so that's a really important technique and we'll talk about that the last thing is is we can actually take the DNA open it up and actually figure out the A's the T's the G's and the C's and actually be able to read the sequence and this is called the sequencing part of the DNA or actually reading the DNA sequence and I'll show you how we do that and again it's another technique that has evolved over time and become more and more automated but it is an important process that we do in the lab in the molecular biology lab and so again another important technique to know so how do we cut the DNA. Well, when we want to cut the DNA, we use these enzymes called restriction enzymes. And these were first found in bacteria. And bacteria make these enzymes in order to eliminate 
DNA that comes from other sources like viruses or other bacteria. And so sometimes it just wants to eliminate it. It'll take these restrictions enzymes that it makes and cut it out of the DNA or the DNA genome. And so as humans, we've actually used these enzymes to our advantage to be able to cut and manipulate DNA. And so how do we do this? Well, restriction enzymes actually recognize specific sequences. And so Think of that each restriction enzyme that I show you is like a different pair of scissors that will recognize only a certain spot in DNA. And each one recognizes a certain sequence. So you can see here, this is the first re restriction enzyme that I'm talking about today, and that's called ECOR1. And where it came from was E. coli. So you can see E. coli, and the R1 just stands for restriction enzyme 1. Okay, And so it recognizes this sequence, G-A-A-T-T-C. And if you look below, it recognizes the same sequence below, G-A-A-T-T-C. And most of these sequences that the enzymes recognize are these palindromes. They're called palindromes, and which means that they're read one way in one direction and they're read the same way in the other direction. And so these palindromic sequences are what these restriction enzymes recognize. And they each recognize their own unique palindrome. So what happens is that the enzyme will come in recognize the sequence, and then it will cut the DNA between the G and the A's. And so what will happen is that the, the enzyme will come in and cut the hydrogen bonds and also cut the phosphate or cut the phosphate linkages between the G and the A. And so what essentially it does is it opens up the DNA. Okay, so if you take my example up here and we look for the sequence, aha, here's G, A, A, T, T, C. The enzyme will come in. It will cut the DNA at this location. Once it's cut, it will remove that fragment, and now you have two fragments of DNA that are floating around. Let's try this with a second enzyme. Now, there's a second enzyme out there called HIN3, and HIN3 just comes from an, a bacteria called Haemophilus influenzae. And this en, uh, enzyme recognizes the specific sequence of AAGCTT. And again, you can see the palindrome, AAGCTT, the reverse. Okay, so what it will do is recognize the, the AA, it will cut it at the AA and all the hydrogen bonds between the other letters and separate the DNA out. So you can see that it splits the DNA, and again, we can see this in my example up here. So if we look for the sequence, here is the AAGCTT, it will come in, it will cut at the AA, remove the hydrogen bonds, and then cut at the AA and below. And so essentially what it will do, we will be removing that fragment. And so now what you can do is put another fragment of DNA in there. And so essentially what you can do is take one strand of DNA and make multiple fragments by using restriction enzymes to cut the DNA. Well, now that I've shown you how you can cut DNA, we can actually glue it back together. And what we use is an enzyme that all cells have called ligase. And ligase is kind of the molecular glue that glues DNA back together. And so if DNA has a sequence that it can recognize, so see here, here's one sequence and here's another sequence. We actually call these sticky ends or overhanging ends because they can bind together. It's kind of having like two flaps and you can stick those flaps together like paper or something else and it gives you some gluing surface. So what we can do is we can glue these back to, or glue these sequences back together using our ligase and it will glue the DNA back together. Again here you have similar sequences. You have complementary sequences here. The glue can be applied it will then glue the DNA back together and put it back together again. And so this is a process of gluing, uh, cutting and gluing the DNA. And well, you might ask, why do we care about this? Well, this is really revolutionized how we've gotten drugs and how different drugs that used to be really hard to manufacture and now become very easy to manufacture. And here's an example. So this is a process called cloning, and cloning just represents taking DNA from multiple organisms and putting it back into another organism. Okay, so what we can take is some bacterial DNA and cut it with a restriction enzyme. So I cut the, cut the bacterial DNA. Well, now I can take other DNA that has these same sticky ends. So you can see an end here and an end here. And we can use something like the human insulin gene. Let's say we want to take the human insulin gene, which was very hard to manufacture because we had to get it from slaughtered pigs, pigs taking it from the pancreases of pigs and actually getting insulin, and now make it very easy because we can take the gene put it into the bacteria, and then put this into back into bacteria and make lots and lots of insulin. So if you could do this technique and put the insulin in, 
you can make lots of insulin and make the big bucks. And so this is what this company did, was make lots and lots of insulin by this process. They made lots and lots of money off of it and now became a multi-billion dollar company called Genentech. And so these were the first guys to actually clone different human genes into bacteria and allow us to make different medicines that people need every day. So things like uh, insulin or factor eight or you know some of these other Pro proteins that people need that don't have, we can now make it very easily in bacteria. And what it's done is made these companies very, very rich by doing this technique. And this is called cloning. Very important process that, you know, if you take certain classes in MATC, you'll actually be able to do. Okay? So cloning DNA. Well, another technique that we can do is actually figure out what the sizes of the, the fragments are. So we can cut the DNA with the restriction enzymes and then figure out what are the sizes. And the way we can do this is by using a technique called gel electrophoresis. And gel electrophoresis works kind of like a game that's on a famous game show. So everyone knows the price is right. And the game is Plinko. Everyone loves Plinko. You know, you see the fans getting crazy. You know, the audience members get up there. And essentially, if you've never seen the game before, what it is is basically the contestants run up the stairs with their little chips. And they take the chip and they drop it down the board and it hits these little pegs all the way down the board. And if it lands in the sweet spot of this $10,000, they win the big money, they get all excited and they take $10,000 home with them. And so that's same, the same kind of process that we see with agarose gels. Agarose gels work on that principle. So think of the agarose as these little pegs scattered throughout the gel. And what it does is allows the DNA to move through and snake through. The interesting thing is, is we talk about size. So if you're a small piece, you can get through these pegs very quickly and very easily, just like a Plinko chip would on the, on the game show. But let's say you put a bunch of chips together and you stuck them together and attach them all as one. Think of that as the DNA fragment, a really large piece. These chips would get stuck quite a bit and run very, very slow because they get kind of tied around these different pegs and everything else. And that's what happens to these large pieces of the DNA. So we're actually able to separate the DNA by running it through a gel because based on size. So the really small pieces move through very quickly because they can bounce through, oops, bounce through the agarose gel very easily. And the large pieces get hung up on these pegs because they're too large to kind of work their way through. And so we can separate by the sizes. So small pieces move faster, they don't get hung up, and the large pieces stay at the top. And so this is how we do it. Now in Plinko, everything runs by gravity. And so the chips run down based on the gravity. Gravity pulls on the chip and pulls it through. We don't have that luxury with DNA. DNA doesn't get pulled through the gel by gravity, but we can actually use the principle of DNA called the electrical charge. Now DNA as a molecule is very negatively charged. So I always think of DNA as very negatively charged. If we apply electrical current to that agarose, what it will allow us to do is actually pull the DNA to the positive charge. Because DNA is negative, it wants to move away from the negative charge and move to the positive charge. Remember, opposites attract. And so this negative DNA will get pulled towards the positive pole. But based on what size DNA you are, depends on how fast you actually move through the gel. So again, the smaller pieces move through very quickly, where the larger pieces get hung up. Now what you can see in this gel is that you get these patterns. And patterns allow us to look at different things and compare different organisms based on patterns. And that's one way we've actually been able to analyze organisms and see how closely related are by just looking at the patterns. Another thing it's allowed us to do is actually really use these things in forensic science. So we can use these things like in crime scene data where we have a suspect and we can see is the suspect ma matching the crime scene data. Or a lot of times you'll see the show Mori Povich and you know, you are the father, you're not the father. And what they do is a simple technique. What they can do is take the DNA from the mom and the child, they run it on a gel and then look at the suspected fathers. And what they can do is then just match the patterns. If Larry here, poor Larry matches the child, he is the father and he will go on the show and he will be responsible for that child. If Bob goes on the show and they measure his DNA, you can see that his patterns don't match. And you can say, okay, Bob, you are not the father. And he'll go running off scene and saying, I told you so. And he'll be the smart guy. And the other lady will go running off crying, trying to figure out who the daddy is. And so that's really how they do it, by looking at the patterns of DNA and figuring out, you know, based on mom and child, who is the daddy based on those things. And that's where a lot of the criminal sciences are going to, matching the patterns.
Okay, and so that's how gel electrophoresis works. So another thing is that along on that topic of forensics, one of those things that the problem is is taking some of the DNA. Now at some of these crime scenes, you're very limited in how much DNA you can actually can grab or how many cells you can grab. And sometimes it's a very small amount. And a way we can do, you know, take that small amount and actually make it usable is by making lots and lots of copies. And the technique that we do with this is called polymerase chain reaction or called PCR. And what it allows us to do is make millions and millions of copies of DNA from a very small amount, okay? And again, we use the DNA's ability to heat and open and close, and it uses a special polymerase that is, can be subjected to heat. And so we call this stuff TAC polymerase because it was isolated from a very thermophilic bacteria that likes heat called Thermus aquaticus, and that's where TAC comes from, Thermus aquaticus. And so TAC comes from that. And how does the process work? Well, PCR works by the process of adding nucleotides so they can make new DNA fragments. You need this TAC polymerase to make the sequences. And then you need these special sequences, which are called primers, which recognize sequences on the DNA. So you kind of have to know some of the sequences on there. And what they do when they don't know is use specific areas that every person has for a sequence, and then they can copy the DNA. And that's how they really do it. So how does this process work? Well, first you heat the DNA up to 95 to separate it. Then you add these primers. And so the primers get added, okay? They add to the DNA. The TAC polymerase comes in makes the new DNA strands, and then after one cycle of heating and cooling, you now have two strands of DNA. If you apply a second cycle to it, you do the same process where you heat and cool, you make more DNA. You can do this over and over again and make eight strands and so on and so forth. So for each cycle after, after each one or each second cycle, you basically double the amount of DNA you have. And so what you can look at is all the PCR cycles, you can make lots and lots of DNA copies. So by the time you do 30 cycles, which can be a matter of two hours, you can have a billion copies of DNA, which is really good, especially if you're talking about forensic science. So it allows you to see and use that DNA in, in certain studies. And again, allows us to collect the samples that are very limited and allows us to make lots and lots of copies in which we can use to compare the DNA between crime, crime scene and suspect and see if they are the person or they're not the person. Okay. Now the last technique that's really revolutionized molecular biology is able to actually read the sequence. And the way that we can read the sequence is by using this technique called DNA sequencing. And this is called the Sanger method because Dr. Sanger was the one that developed this method. And basically, again, what, a, what we do is we heat the DNA to open it up, and then we make sequences based on the sequence that we have. Okay, so what's involved? Well, we use the nucleotides just like in PCR. But instead of adding the primers in the certain cases, we actually use these things called deoxynucleotides. And these are special nucleotides that stop the sequence on that specific nucleotide. And so it will tell us, and they're labeled either with radiate, radioactivity or with a color that tell us what that letter is. And so we can use this to actually figure out the sequences. And of course, the other thing we use is DNA polymerase. So what we do is we heat the DNA up, so we again get single strands, and then we run the DNA polymerase. And when we do this, we can make different sequences. And you can see, normally the sequence gets made with the nucleotides, but as soon as that one nucleotide, that special nucleotide gets added, the sequence stops. And that tells us what that nucleotide is based on whatever it ends up with. And so we can take all these different fragments that we make in the sequencing DNA, and then put them together and then run them on a gel. And if you remember the process of electrophoresis, the smallest fragments end up on the bottom and the largest fragments end up at the top. And then you can tell based on which color end up on the gel or which lane that they're in, you can tell the sequence based on, on those different information. And so you can say that this is an A, this is a G, this is a T, this is a C, and so on and so forth. And what you end up with is the sequence. And we can take that sequence and say, aha, that's my sequence of my DNA. Well, now this process is completely automated. It used to be very painstakingly slow, laborious process in which people had to look at it by using their eyesight and go nuts looking at all these sequences. Well, now we have computers to do all this stuff. Basically, you add your components, 
let the computer do it, and it can analyze thousands of base pairs within a couple of hours and give you lots and lots of sequencing information. And what it's allowed us to do is actually sequence genomes. And so one of the genomes that actually have been sequenced is the human. And in humans, it started back in 1990, and we finished this up in about 2003. What we've come to identify is that humans have about 20,500 genes in, the, in our DNA, and it's led really to the advancements of genetic testing. So not only has it allowed us to look for mutations that people might have, but also as ways to screen, maybe for possible cancer genes. So some of you have heard of Angelina Jolie and looking at these different cancers or genes that she might have. Also allowing for screens for potential parents so that they can look to see to make sure that they're healthy, their genes are healthy, so that their child's going to be healthy. And it allows them to look at the potential genes or what certain diseases, genetic diseases that they could carry on to their child. And so they could choose whether to have children or not based on some of the genetic testing is done. And so this has really, really revolutionized how we can look at our genes themselves. But we've also looked at a lot of other genomes. And so we've sequenced a ton of genomes to date. And again, we've sequenced a number of archaebacteria and quite a lot of bacterial uh, genomes and then quite a few eukaryotes as well. Now you may be asking why have we done so many bacteria and not so many eukaryotes because eukaryotes seem to be more important. Well, bacteria one are much easier to do because they're only a single chromosome and eukaryotes have multiple chromosomes. Think of humans, we have 46 compared to one chromosome found in bacteria. Also, eukaryotes have exons and introns, which makes the process much harder because you have to figure out where is the reading DNA and what is the non-reading DNA. And so it makes sequencing much more harder. And so a lot of companies don't want to spend the money to actually sequence these genomes because it is a long and tiring process to do, even with computers. And so that's why eukaryotes haven't been sequenced as much as the bacteria have in, in the past. So I've talked about all these different things so far and what molecular biology has come to, but where is it going in the future? Well, there's a lot of future at stake in molecular biology, and one of those is actually looking at how genes are expressed. And so what I mean by that is actually taking organisms and taking a snapshot of what their genes are doing at that time. So what we can do is do something like this, where we can infect an animal and say, what is going on, what genes are turned on at eight hours, what genes are turned out at 24 hours and what genes are turned on at 48 hours. And we can look at all these different things and compare them based on this gene expression data. And so that's one of the things we're looking at, what genes get turned on and what genes get turned off. The other thing we're looking at is what proteins are being made. And so how are the proteins interacting with one another? How are they used in the cells and how do they play with one another? And so that's an important thing as well. And this is called proteomics. When we did all the genomic studies, that was called genomics. And now the looking at and characterizing proteins is called proteomics. And so looking at how proteins interact with one another. And then finally, the next big revolutionary step is looking at stem cells. And that process is basically taking cells from your body basically reprogram those cells to make all new cells in your body so that you can replace things that get old and fall apart. And so this is the part that I think is really going to revolutionize medicine in the next 10 to 15 years. And what we're going to be able to do is take cells from your body, reprogram to stem cells, and then be able to make new organs. And why is this important? Well, you know that there's things out there called a donor list and donor registration and all these things and the fear of rejection. Well, if we could take our own cells and grow our own organs from our cells, this would eliminate the need for having donors, for one thing, and the need or the risk of transplantation loss or fear of rejection. Because if it's their own cells, your immune system won't attack them. And so this is a really important step. If we're able to grow uh, organs in Petri dishes or take cadaver hearts and replace them with our own cells, we can really revolutionize biology. And this is really where medicine's going these days. Okay, and so that's that's where the future is lying in molecular biology. So let's summarize what we've learned. And so really the important process of DNA or important property of DNA is actually the ability to open close DNA by heating it up. So when we heat DNA up, we open it and we cool it back down, we close it back up. And there's certain tools that we can utilize in molecular biology to allow us to play and manipulate DNA. And that includes cutting the DNA with restriction enzymes, gluing it back together with this ligase enzyme, figuring out the sizes of DNA using gel electrophoresis, 
copying the DNA, going from very small samples to very large samples using the technique called PCR, and then being able to determine the gene sequences using sequencing and reading the DNA. And again, in the future, we're going to be seeing things of how gene expression affects cells, looking at how proteins themselves affect the cells, and then finally looking at stem cells and how they're going to change the future. And again, if any of you are really interested in learning some of these techniques, I'll be glad to show you some of these techniques in the lab. The other thing we'll be able to do is actually point you in the right direction and actually have you guys take some biotechnology classes, and you'll actually be doing these things in the biotechnology class. So if you have any questions for me, please feel free to ask. And if you're really interested in learning any things, please feel free to talk to me about them. I'd really be happy to tell you about these things. And with that, we've come to the end of the lecture. If you have any questions, please let me know. And we'll, you know, we'll keep going on these things. I appreciate you watching these videos, and I'll talk to you next time. Thanks for watching.